So no matter what may be happening in my life, no matter what circumstances may be swirling around me, whether I am feeling like my life is pulling me in multiple directions simultaneously, which kind of makes you feel like you're everywhere and nowhere at the same time, or whether I'm sitting in silence and feeling sadness because of loss. In my life, that's been at times loss of a job, loss of a loved one, loss of a dream. It could be whether I'm tired at the end of the day or I'm tired and waking into a new day. At certain moments along the way, for the past several years, my son Ian will approach me silently, usually with a little grin on his face. And without saying a word, he'll do this. He'll extend his hand towards mine, and he'll just say two words, Daddy's hand. And as soon as he says that, I now know my required response, which is I extend my hand towards his, and we join them, usually in a very tight clasp. (laughs) And that's followed by a grin and sometimes some laughter. But it seems like no matter what's going on in my life, however quiet or chaotic it is, that ordinary moment becomes extraordinary. A simple act has profound impact on my state of being. Because Ian so naturally reminds me in those moments that however disconnected I may be feeling from circumstances in the world, disconnected from my relationship with the created world, circumstances that cause me to feel disconnected from other people, even disconnected from myself. Through that simple exchange, Ian reminds me of my connectedness. And that even though circumstances may say otherwise, appearances may give me a different impression. Underneath those circumstances and those appearances, there is an eternal connection between me and my creator, between me and other creations, between me and creation. By simply reaching out and clasping my hand, Ian reminds me of this profound reality. We are one. Jesus was walking along the road towards Gethsemane. It was really his last chance to have extended time with his friends. And as they were on that long walk, he poured out his heart to them. And in some cases, especially in John's gospel, he repeats himself a bit. And he may even ramble or go off on tangents here or there. But his heart is so filled and his mind is so occupied and maybe in some ways preoccupied with what's about to happen that you get this long rambling discourse of him sharing his inmost thoughts and feelings with his friends. And this little snippet that we read is kind of right at the heart of what Jesus is trying to communicate with his closest friends. And he uses an image that would be very familiar to them. It's an image that goes back into the ancient past of their faith tradition But it's also something that they would know being in a mostly agrarian society. Jesus talks about a vine, a vineyard. Now in olden times, the image that those Jewish believers would have had is that they were the vine. 
prophet Isaiah uses this image and elsewhere as well. That the people of God were the vine. But Jesus, as usual, takes an old image and puts a new twist on it. When he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and we are connected and interconnected. The vine is the source of all nourishment, all sustenance, all vitality, all life. And the sense I get from what he's sharing with his friends is this. When we forget the source of our life, our nourishment, our vitality, and when we seek those things, not internally, from within the vine that we're directly connected to, but externally, that's when we begin to run the risk of slowly and surely dying on the vine. Now, it's natural as a human being to need external forms of encouragement, affirmation. It's a part of life. But I wonder if Jesus is saying here that when that becomes our primary source of not only nourishment and vitality, but also identity, when we begin to get our deeper sense of self-worth from what other people think of us, the words that we hear from them, the responses that we might receive to things that we do and create and produce, that's when the branch starts stretching itself farther and farther from its source. And we tend to know what happens when that happens. The connectedness to the true source becomes more and more stretched. Sometimes to the point of breaking. Sometimes to the point of withering and dying. It's so easy to forget who we are and whose we are. And maybe that's another way of saying this. That Jesus is inviting and encouraging his followers to remember that core value, that core identity that comes from within and that is expressed externally. I mean, the branches really are meant to be an extension and an expression of that inner life, nourishment, vitality, beauty, sustenance. And if you want to take the image further, hope and joy and peace and justice and ultimately love. And not only do branches need the vine, but I wonder if Jesus is also kind of implying from this that the vine needs the branches. I mean, think about it. Or think about a tree. What would a tree be without the branches? Trunk. You imagine a forest with a bunch of trunks? Where is the vitality? Where is the fruit, the nourishment? Where is the shade that that tree would provide? Where is the beauty? Branches extend and express eternally and externally all that is within the vine. And those extensions and expressions bring the life and vitality and nourishment and hope and joy and love in ways that reveal those connections between creator and creation and creations. Which is kind of like what Jesus did by calling together a disparate group of people. Think about this. Jesus had a group, a small inner circle, that included zealots and tax collectors. 
Now, not always being connected to ancient history, we tend to read all that kind of as one piece. You want to put that into modern terms? That would be like calling together the resistors and the tea partiers together into one small, close-knit, tight community. A community that had disagreements, that had not only differences of opinion, but at times differences of conviction. And yet this is the first community that Jesus creates? Why? How? And again, I wonder if it's like that image that William James highlights on one of the cover quotes for the bulletin this week. That image that when you look out at a sea and you see islands they appear to be incredibly disconnected from one another. But when you look beneath the surface of the water, they're all connected. And I wonder if Jesus does this because he realizes that's not just a human connection, a shared blood, a shared sense of being, but that that is a connection of spirit. That is a connectedness of love that is so easy to lose sight of when all we see are islands and vast ocean of differences between us. Jesus recognizes that love, like the ocean, goes deeper. That in his case, Love even goes deeper than the grave. Deeper than death itself. And when we think that those inner convictions come from the deepest place within us, I wonder if Jesus is reminding us that however strongly and however fervently and intentionally and prayerfully we hold those convictions there's always something that goes a little bit deeper and that maybe is a little more powerful and maybe is the source of the strength of those convictions but is also the source of the strength of those connections. I got to live an experience yesterday that to me very powerfully illustrated this. And it was simply a get together at my house that I had nothing to do with. And my wife Kirsten had everything to do with. Because Kirsten is one of those people who lives in such a way that she is aware, she is awakened, and she embodies that sense of connectedness. And she saw two people in her life who had grown disconnected. Further and further apart because of life circumstances, because of decisions that one or the other had made, that it had pretty harrowing impact on their relationship, on their families. And yet Kirsten remembered that down beneath all of that, there's a connectedness. There is this sense that we all are one. And so she took the step and gradual steps of reaching out to both of them, individually, initially, and then eventually deciding to run the risk of hosting a dinner party at our house with both of their families. And to her amazement, to my amazement, to all of our mutual amazement, nobody got injured. No plates were thrown. No one walked out in a huff. It was tentative. It was a bit uncertain. And yet by the end of it, those two friends actually took a selfie together and sent it to Kirsten to say thank you for seeing something that 
in their current situation of life, it was difficult for the two of them to recognize. Some of you have asked and wonder why I invite us at the end of each worship service to hold hands. And I imagine some of you may think it's because I'm a touchy-feely guy and I have warm, fuzzy memories of past experiences and if I really had my way, we wouldn't only hold hands, we would sing Kumbaya every Sunday. That is not why I ask you to hold hands. Part of the reason I ask you to hold hands is because of my experience of daddy's hand. Part of the reason I ask you to join hands is so that you will have a visceral, tangible reminder of that connection and connectedness. And that as you prepare to leave this place and re-enter that world that in so many ways is disconnected, fragmented, frazzled, that you would have one more reminder that that's not all there is. And that you're walking back out into your lives and into that world knowing that you are not alone. That we are connected through invisible connections that have visible manifestations. It's maybe a way for us to be reminded that at the heart of it all, at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, at every moment during the day, whether we believe it or not, we are one. And maybe it also is an encouragement for you in your own way, in your own life, to leave here and to go back out into your world. And at a certain moment, an ordinary moment, to see someone and maybe to reach out your hand. Whether you do it physically or not. As a way for you not only to remember your connectedness, but to share that gift, even in an invisible way, with someone else. To see them and to recognize them for who they are. Even if they're arguing with you. Even if they're ignoring you. Even if they're making your life in that moment very challenging and difficult. Remember, remember, remember the one who is the vine. Remember that you are branches. And remember that together we are a vineyard. And that fruit is not meant to stay on the vine. It's meant to be taken. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be given. Amen.